seen all of Shakespeare's plays? All of them? I'm very impressed, Ruth. <laughs> It's an awful, there's an awful lot of plays. Um, I guess most of us will have read one or two or been made to read a few at school. Um, we may have watched them uh, in film versions or, or at the theatre. Uh, but all of them, that's a massive achievement. It's just a huge project, isn't it? St. George, he had a massive project too, Go Fight the Dragon. Um, however mythical that tale might be. But for many of us, we'll think about doing something. We'll look at it and then suddenly decide, oh, that's just too much. It's too big a project. Now, whether that's something on a global scale like ending war, or reversing climate change, or whether it's in the small things like, one day I'm going to tidy that cupboard. One day I'm going to read that book. We look at projects and we decide our resources just aren't enough. We don't have the time or the energy or the will to actually do it. And sometimes that applies even to small things, doesn't it? But today's reading gives us some key lessons about our Christian life. Key lessons that tell us that God has the resources for us to use. And that no project is too big for him. And we also see... Jesus' kingdom way of doing things. So let's look at John chapter 6 together. Page 1074, if you want to look at it in the Bibles, although the verses will be up on the screens as well. It's been a familiar, it's a, sure it's a familiar passage to many of us. But we need to look at it afresh each time we come to God's word. See what God's saying to us today. So I'm going to look at it in four sections. And the first section, verses 1 to 4, why we come to Jesus. In chapter 5, Jesus has been teaching in Jerusalem. Chapter 6, verse 1 starts, after this. So it's probably some time later. He's made the journey back from Jerusalem to Galilee, which is a few days' journey on foot. And he's probably been teaching in Galilee, in the towns and villages around the lake. And he's been teaching and healing as usual. So we see in verse 2, the crowd follows him because of the signs he was doing on the sick. They're following the miracle worker, the healer. Maybe they'd come for healing themselves. Maybe they wanted healing for someone else. Maybe they were just following the new sensation, this great new teacher. Maybe he won't just heal, but he'll, he'll do something even better than that. They were following him for all sorts of reasons. And in Mark's account of the healing of the 5,000, Mark chapter 6, verse 34, we read, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus looked at the crowd, all these people coming, following him for all sorts of reasons. And he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. They wanted the authoritative teaching that Jesus was giving. We read in verse five, chapter 5, verse 17. He's been teaching and healing with the authority of God the Father. The crowd were recognizing that there was something special about him. And they wanted the authenticity and the truth that Jesus brought. And that hunger's still around today, isn't it? People are looking 
for truth. They're looking for purpose in life. They're looking for the authenticity that only Jesus can bring. And there's another strand to this opening passage. Coupled with Jesus' authority, we read in verse 4 that the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Now, there was always great anticipation around Passover because it was a reminder of God freeing the Israelites from slavery in Egypt, restoring them as a nation, showing his power in defeating Pharaoh's army. So maybe the crowd were coming as well, looking for a new Passover miracle. Maybe they were coming looking for new freedom. Maybe this time, freedom from the Romans rather than the Egyptians. Was this new teacher, this new sensation, going to bring them a new freedom? So as people come to Jesus looking for healing, looking for authority, looking for a purpose in life, looking for freedom from all sorts of things that trap them and bind them and hold them down, how can we help them find Jesus? So verses 5 to 9 asks us, what are our resources? Well, verses 5 to 7, Philip's response was complete despair, wasn't it? He was from this part of Galilee. He knew the area. He knew there wasn't a Tesco or a Morrison's on every corner. He knew there weren't even the corner shops in the village. There was no way that this part of Galilee was going to provide enough food for all these people. And even if it could, it was going to cost eight months' salary to feed them. 200 denarii, about eight months' wages for the average man. There was no way they could be fed. Complete despair. We can't do this. We haven't got the resources. There's no chance. We can't tackle this project. Verses 8 to 9, well, Andrew's response was a bit better, wasn't it? But not a lot. He says, well, we've been out looking, and all we can find is this one lad. And he's got a few baps and a couple of small fish. I mean, that's his snack for lunch. Barely enough to keep him going. Never mind everybody else. Yeah, we'd like to help but we can't even scratch the surface with this. And those are responses when we look at the needs of the world or the needs of our community. Do we ask what resources have we got and say, it's just too much. It's beyond my limited resources. Or do we get on with it? And do something, however little, trusting that Jesus will do the rest. Because as we see in verses 10 to 13, he has the resources. Jesus has the resources. So verse 10, he sits everyone down. And John, incidentally, notices that there's lots of grass on the hillside. And that confirms that it's near Passover because that was the only time of year there's grass on the hillsides of Galilee in the spring. Then he gives thanks over the bread, which reminds us, doesn't it, of the Last Supper at Passover when he gives thanks for the bread bread and the wine. That might seem strange, He's giving thanks. He's saying thank you for the provision of five small rolls and a couple of little fish. 
in front of 5,000 people. That really is stretching it, isn't it? But he clearly knows what will happen. He gives thanks to his father in advance of the miracle. He gives thanks that his power will be seen and his compassion can be expressed so practically. Compassion for people who are hungry, not just for his teaching, but hungry for something to eat because they've been out away from home for so long. Just as at the Last Supper, he gives thanks that his death would be a ransom for many. Matthew 20, verse 28. His resources are limitless. His power enables anything to happen. It has no constraints. He could feed 5,000 or he could have fed 50,000 with the same five loaves and two fishes. We saw all that leftovers, 12 baskets of leftovers. His power knows no constraints. And that was the power that we saw Elijah showing in our first reading. He, was, he healed the stew, if you can put it that way. He took the poison out of the stew. And then he fed this huge group of prophets with a small amount of bread. God's power knows no constraints. It knew no constraints on the hillside feeding the 5,000. It knew no constraints when it raised Jesus from death. A couple of things for us to note at this point. Whatever we start in Jesus' name, however limited our resources or our ambition, he will bless it if we're doing it in his name because his resources are unlimited. Don't hold back because you think you can't do it. And don't prevaricate. Find a way to get on with it. Every journey begins with a single step, they say. Every task we do starts with us actually making that first step. And the second thing to note is that Jesus' compassion covers physical and spiritual needs. Sharing the good news of the kingdom included satisfying their hunger because he knows People don't listen very well if their tummies are rumbling. So as we reach out to a lost world with the good news of the gospel, we need to be practical as well as spiritual. We have to meet the needs of the whole person wherever we can. Compassion covers physical and spiritual needs. So what is the response to Jesus? Verses 14 and 15. It's clear as we go on in this chapter that people listening to Jesus get confused. They thought he was talking entirely about physical needs. And we'll look at the next parts of this uh, chapter 6 over the next two or three weeks. But I just want to look on briefly to verses 30 and 34. To remember that this is Passover time. It's a time for celebration of when God freed Israel from slavery in Egypt. When he led them out into the desert and he fed them with manna. Flakes like bread that came down from heaven every morning to feed them in the desert. And Jesus says here that the manna was physical food provided by God. It kept them alive in the desert. It met the Israelites' physical needs. But now he is going to provide the bread from heaven to give you life. True bread. And the people then say in verse 34, give us this bread always. I don't want to go shopping anymore. You give me the bread. Because I'm sure they were confused. They were expecting physical bread every day on the table. This five loaves and two fish miracle repeated endlessly. 
And of course, they've got it wrong. Just as they have immediately after the miracle. Go back to verses 14 and 15. When they saw the sign that he had done, they said, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. The prophet. This was the prophet who was to be like Moses, foretold in Deuteronomy 18. A new leader for Israel. And again, there's echoes of the Passover here, aren't there? If it's a new Moses, a new prophet, he might lead them to a new freedom. Not just from Egypt, but maybe from the Romans. So in verse 15, we read that they plan to take him by force and make him king. So Jesus withdrew from them. He left them. Now, it would be very strange, wouldn't it, to have an unwilling king, somebody you crowned forcibly and said, you're such a fantastic guy, you're going to be king. And he said, no, 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 not me, not me, not me. But that's what Jesus did. It's not his way to be a king in the way they wanted. He's not going to bring continuous physical satisfaction, food on the table every day. And he doesn't bring us freedom from all the pressures, all the sorrows, all the problems, all the troubles of this life. But what he does offer us is the kingdom way. He offers us the kingdom of heaven. He offers us a new life in a new relationship with his Father. You can we go on to the next slide, Tom, please? He offers us freedom, not from all the pressures of daily life, <clears throat> but pressures from the freedom from the pressures and the guilt of sin. He offers us the power that fed 5,000 people from five loaves to support and encourage us every day. He offers us the bread of life to sustain us as we face each day. Because he came, became king, going freely and willingly to the cross and was crowned through his death and his resurrection. His victory is over death and sin. Not by being taken by force to become the king the people wanted, but crowned by God to become king of creation, king of the universe, king forever. As he said to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. It's beyond this world, it's outside this world, it's above this world, it's greater than this world. Because his miracles, or his signs, as John calls them in his gospel, they all point to his power and his authority over sickness and death and creation. He heals the sick. He raises the dead. He transforms the bread and the fish. He calms the storm. His authority is over all creation. But his real power is shown in his resurrection, in his power over sin and death, his power to bring new life to all who believe and trust in him, his power to support, encourage, and equip us, his people, to share his compassion, his love, his grace into a needy world, to bring physical and spiritual comfort, encouragement, love, and grace to those around us to show his love to our neighbors in whatever way we can. As he saw the crowd and had compassion on them, let us look at our neighbors and have compassion on them. Because we're called to follow him, trusting in his power, his life, and his love, 
sharing the good news of the kingdom with all those we meet and walk in the kingdom way day by day, knowing his resurrection power equipping us, knowing his resources are available for us, knowing that his love sustains us in all we do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word as it shows us your love brought down to earth in us, to us in your Son, who showed his power and his authority over your world, who died showing our, his love for us, and who was raised to life to show his victory over sin and death. May we share his love and his compassion. May we know his resources, equipping us and encouraging us in his service. Amen. Well, our final song reminds us that God does take care of us, encourage us, and supports us. And that one day... We will feast in the heavenly banquet with him as I